and now look to Miranda Brown to continue the case for the proposition. Good evening. I'm not going to talk about the political processes in the UN. I'm not going to talk about past failures, past successes, but I'm going to try and give you an insider's perspective of what it's like to work as a UN staff member. But first, by way of background, I should say that I worked um, as a government official, as an Australian uh, member of the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. Um, this is equivalent to the UK's Foreign Office for nearly a decade before I joined the UN. So I came to the UN with a government perspective. So I'm going to give you two examples of what I witnessed in the UN and why I think it's important for you to support the proposition. Before I start, I just want to say that I strongly support the UN. I strongly support its mandate. And I don't deny that it has made a fantastic contribution and it has changed the lives of many people and it continues to deliver services to people in the worst circumstances. My first example for you is the situation at the World Intellectual Property Organization, WIPO. So WIPO is the organization that deals with patents and trademarks and copyright. It's a very important organization for innovation and all of our countries uh, participate in it. It's also a relatively wealthy organization because it, its funding source comes from primarily from patent fees. I went to work at WIPO as the strategic advisor to the director general. This is a senior level position in the organization. I went there to try and assist the, the leadership to make things work and to solve some of the problems inside the organization. But within a short while, of working there, I realized that uh, things were not as they seemed. I found um, that there were serious allegations of abuse of authority by the, by the leadership of the organization. And I also found out that the organization had been shipping American computers, IT equipment, servers, and routers to North Korea, and subsequently to also to Iran and that these shipments were likely in violation of sanctions, UN sanctions possibly, but certainly US domestic sanctions, and that they hadn't been endorsed by the member states. These shipments allegedly occurred, um, the Director General had authorized them in exchange for North Korea and Iran's support for his election. I was very disturbed by, by these shipments and I immediately went to the Director General and requested that he uh, desist from, from the project. Um, unfortunately, he wouldn't hear my concerns and I was put in a very difficult position of what to do with that information. I decided that I had no option but to report these shipments to the Member States and this is what I did. After that, I couldn't stay at WIPO. I was forced to leave, and uh, the Director General accused me of being disloyal and too close to the member states. Uh, as I left WIPO, I also reported other abuses of authority, including the theft of DNA from WIPO staff. And these allegations, together with other allegations relating to the corruption of a procurement process, were then investigated by external investigators who concluded in the case of the procurement corruption that the Director General's code of Director General's behavior was not consistent, arguably not consistent with the International Civil <coughs> Service Code of Conduct to which he was bound. And in the case of the DNA theft, concluded, well, was actually unable to reach a conclusion because the Swiss authorities where WIPO is based refused to cooperate with the investigation. <coughs> To cut a long story short, there was no accountability. The Director General remains in office, and those that have raised the concerns about what is going on in that organization have suffered consequences. Either they have lost their jobs, or they're now exposed and subject to retaliation. I'm now going to give you a second example of my experience of working in the UN. 
I, after WIPO, I moved to the UN's Human Rights Office, where I worked as the chief of the Africa section, which covers East and Southern Africa, which includes Sudan, South Sudan, Somalia, um, as peace, peacekeeping missions. And during my time in, in the UN's Human Rights Office, OHCHR, um, I, I undertook missions to these countries, to Somalia, to South Sudan, to witness firsthand the work of the Human Rights Office in documenting and reporting human rights violations in these conflict zones. Much of the work that, that is done, I think, is done with very best intentions. These peacekeeping operations work in very different, in very difficult contexts. Uh, the staff also experience huge challenges. The, the situation is very difficult. There are security concerns, and the people with whom they work are often in, in very dire circumstances. In July 2014, this was two years ago, the, the, a report of allegations of serious child sexual abuse came to Geneva and the report was delivered to my supervisor, Anders Kampus. Anders Kampus felt that he had an obligation to act. The report documented child sexual abuse going back several months and had not, the, the sexual abuse was ongoing and nothing, or at least no action that was effective had been taken and these children continued to be abused over a period of several months. Some of them were as young as eight years old. The young boys were being sexually abused by French troops and other troops in exchange for food. And so Anders Kampus, when he read the report, he felt he had no option but to act, and he transmitted that report to the French government, and the French government immediately took action and dispatched a team of investigators to the Central African Republic and provided a commitment in writing that they would immediately take action to stop the abuse, and that indeed occurred. The abuse stopped. However, nine months later, the UN leadership saw fit to put Anders Kampus under investigation for his transmittal of the report to the French government. And Around about that time, I, I found out about this, so this was in March 2015, and I couldn't, I was extremely concerned. I couldn't believe that the one person who had taken action to stop the abuse was then under investigation. And indeed, in the intervening nine months, little had happened um, in terms of prosecuting those who'd been accountable or even examining, c conducting a lessons learnt and taking steps to ensure that this didn't happen again. And so I again felt that I had an obligation to report this, to report this abuse of authority by the UN leadership in relation to Anders. And so I disclosed that to the member states. What followed was that the, the, the leadership in New York decided to establish a panel to examine what had occurred in the Central African Republic. And that panel concluded in its report that there was a gross institutional failure in terms of the UN's response in the Central African Republic. All I can say to you is subsequent to that, I have become aware through colleagues in the field contacting me and providing me with information, and through reports that you will see that are publicly available, that the scale of the problem is significantly larger than we, that we had previously thought. This, this sexual abuse in peacekeeping missions is widespread. The Secretary General has taken steps, some steps, to address it. But the problem is the UN leadership has, at, up until now, focused on the peacekeepers and the troop-contributing countries who s provide their troops to the UN so that it can provide peacekeeping services. And while a, a significant proportion, perhaps the majority of these abuses are committed by these troops, a significant proportion of abuses are also committed by UN staff. And so my, my plea to you tonight is to recognise that there's been a failure, to recognise that the institution is failing. And I believe that the institution is failing because it lacks proper accountability structures that we would know of in our governments. There's no independent oversight function. 
There's no independent ethics office. All of these, both these functions report to the Secretary General. The UN cannot police itself. And so it's up to the member states and yourselves, the people, to ensure that our governments are, make a tough and thorough assessment and fix the problem. It's taxpayer funds that support the UN and it's the taxpayers that must ensure that our governments take a tough stance and give the new Secretary General a strong message. And that message is that the institution inside, as it stands, is failing and must be fixed. It's a case of neglect. Thank you.